We have two speakers today. We start off with Marion Oswald, followed by Alex Rudrushova. Um, and Marion um, is uh, the first of the two speakers and um, is going to start the talk. Marion, would you like to start by uh, sharing your first slide just to make sure? Sure, let me do that. Marion is going to talk about good law, good science and accountability. Uh, she is a senior fellow in law at the University of Northumbria. Uh, she is a special advisor to the Justice and Home Affairs Committee on the area of technology and the application of law. Uh, she's also affiliated with the Alan Turing Institute, and we're delighted to have her here today to speak. Um, so, Mary, please get started. Thanks very much, Sophia. Um, it's great to be here, and thank you very much for inviting me along. Um, Apologies if my voice sort of starts cracking up <laughs> during this talk. I've been suffering for one of these terrible colds for a while. It doesn't seem to be going away, non-COVID related. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I uh, the title of my talk is Good Law, Good Science and Accountability, um, focused on achieving trustworthy use of emerging tech in policing. Um, this is an area that I've been researching and, and thinking about for, for some time now. Um, and uh, there might be those who, who think uh, uh, that evaluating the use of science and um, AI and, and machine learning based on societal impacts um, might be outside the the purview of, of statistics or particular academic disciplines. But I think when we're talking about machine learning, statistics, AI and criminal justice, we can't afford to discount the context uh, and the impact, impact and the consequences of potentially tarring people with the wrong brush. It, it can be the most serious um, that there is. And the tools themselves can, can really define and shape police practices and what and what the police do or don't do um, within their um, strategy and activities. So um, I'd like to first start by highlighting um, some of the opportunities and challenges that statistics and machine learning presents within policing. And it's very clear that these tools, statistical tools, machine learning, AI can uh, very much um, enable the more effective analysis of disparate digital data sources that are often scattered about in all sorts of different data sets um, and uh, places or around policing um, and within other agencies. And, and by bringing these together, they can very much support a preventative approach to policing rather than a reactive, a more traditional reactive approach to harm. And, and the police officers, police forces that I've engaged with have a, a really genuine sense of a responsibility to make the best use of the data sources that they have available to them or that they can obtain. And that is a, a very genuinely held uh, view that their responsibilities under human rights legislation, under their policing powers, um, uh, really mean that they should look at, at new ways of handling data, new ways of analysing data uh, in order to protect the public and in order to address significant problems that we see across the board. Um, intelligence gaps, management of risk, um, management of offenders, um, addressing uh, disproportionate approaches to policing that might be highlighted by, by their own data. So, so that's a bit of background. Um, it, certainly in the UK, um, despite the, the positives that I've just outlined, there, there are con uh, considerable concerns about um, 
this issue of accountability for the uses of new technology and new methods of data ana analytics. Um, it's been the landscape for accountability has been described to me as very confused. There's no single regulatory voice um, to oversee what's going on within policing. Um, in England and Wales, we have 43 different police forces that are potentially all doing um, uh, their own thing in this area. And it's very much, as somebody said to me, uncertain that the police have sufficient public trust to take, to take things forward on their own without being accused of marking their own homework. Uh, so th there really needs to be this uh, increased public debate about what's going on, uh, a cataloguing of what's going on, and that might be helped by the, the recent algorithmic transparency standard that's just been released by the UK government. Um, developing new guidance and actually checking and testing um, our thinking um, centrally and regionally with the assistance of you know, independent um, oversight, independent bodies, uh, external experts, etc. Um, Mike Rowe, who works um, works with us at Northumbria, has has argued that um, there's the type of oversight that's needed for these new methods of data analytics probably need to be sufficient, you know, significantly transformed in order to really um, be adequate for the new methods of data analytics that we're starting to see. I'm involved by with one of these potential new methods of um, regulation and achieving accountability, which is an ethics committee that was established about three years ago now by West Midlands Police, which is one of the larger police forces in the UK. Um, the reason the um, ethics committee was established was specifically to work alongside the police forces internal data lab. Um, which is a, a, a part of the police force that employs uh, statisticians, data scientists directly to develop um, new technologies and new ways of data analytics for the force. So what we do within that um, committee is that we work alongside the data lab to um, review their ideas from start to finish um, in terms of, sort of piloting stage uh, all the way up to uh, operationalizing um, uh, data analytics and, and new technologies um, so that there is a, a method of independent um, oversight and scrutiny of what's going on within the force. Everyone on that committee um, is a volunteer. Uh, we have lots of different backgrounds, uh, um, lawyers, uh, data scientists, both academic and commercial data scientists, people uh, with ethics backgrounds, people who have uh, experience of working with victims. So quite a wide range of expertise on that committee. So what I've tried to do um, recently is actually step back from, from that committee which I chair and try and have a look at the sort of themes that have been emerging from the um, from the debates and the projects that we've we've seen. And um, I'd like to just spend some time um, having a look at those themes because I, I think they they demonstrate really the the connection between the statistics and the data science and the the way that these tools are used in a policing um, context. I mean, it's very clear that um, all these proposals and projects that have come before the committee have been um, intended to address an important policing or societal is issue. Um, for example, um, uh, looking at uh, the decline uh, year on year in the proportion of rape and sexual offence um, cases that actually resulted in a charge and trying to work out the reasons for that. Um, looking at uh, youth and most and, and serious violence, which try to consider 
um, whether there were particular factors that could inform why or when young people get involved in serious violence. Um, and also um, a, a, an example is a disproportionality project, which actually looked at the police's own data to try and uh, analyse whether there was evidence of disproportionality within the data sets, particularly by ethnicity and sex. Um, so there is there's very clear evidence that um, the police are not just doing uh, doing data science for the sake of it. There are there are reasons behind it, and they are attempting to address these important um, societal issues. What I think is really key, um, though, is that um, the committee um, is always very concerned about how the tool itself will be operationalized, a terrible word, but um, you know, used in practice, and what interventions in respect of individuals will result um, from, from the use of the tool. So there's a real clear link between the um, you know, the validity of the output and then what happens to an individual as a result. Um, and I think it's it was perhaps a surprise to the police representatives that, that liaise with the committee that actually that is such a key point um, for committee members, because I think that perhaps they expected us to focus, you know, on, on the sort of detailed data science aspects. But I think it's much clearer now that there's the link, there's a real clear link between um, uh, the, the validity of the output and then what happens to an individual and what you should do with that tool within within a policing context. Um, that links very closely to data protection concerns and, and legal concerns about the creation of personal data about an individual, which is effectively what these tools do. They create um, an inference or a prediction about about somebody which is a new piece of personal data and then that's got to be handled and used appropriately which which brings in um, many data protection um, points which have, then of course links to um, how you produce the output in the first place um, uh, whether you're using appropriate data inputs uh, for the question that you're trying to answer, um, what the uh, the validity of the output is from a statistical point of view. Um, there's been w only one project so far where the committee has recommended that it does not go forward, effectively it's stopped, um, and that was a, a most serious violence predictive model um, which did not proceed primarily based on the lack of statistical validity, it had precision rates of 38% at best. And so there was, you know, basically a, a huge concern about uh, any coercive interventions or even interventions that weren't coerces, but but an individual might think of as intruding into their, into their life that could result as a result of um, an output that really didn't have, um, you know, for, even from a sort of layperson's perspective, a, a, a you know, scientific um, and statistical validity behind it. As you might expect, we've been concerned about um, any potential biases within the data and, and hence why the police themselves have tried to explore that within their own data and um, <clears throat> any uh, any imp the impacts that might occur in respect of false positives, for example, in respect of a project that might that is trying to link people to uh, crimes of modern slavery, um, having a large false positive rate in respect of those types of crimes again could have a, a quite a serious impact um, on on um, the way an individual is categorised within police systems. And finally, another theme that emerged was concern about um, vulnerable victims and individuals that might emerge from some of this data analytics and whether any limitations should be placed on interactions with other agencies, for example, immigration authorities. Because, you know, once this information emerges, you potentially have to do something with it and there are consequences um, of that. 
So those are some of the big themes that um, emerged from the thematic, well, the thematic analysis of, of the minutes. I, the reason I did it that way was I, I because I'm, I'm involved in the committee itself, I wanted to sort of try and stand back from the activities which I might be criticised as being a bit too close to and see what what themes emerge from that type of analysis rather than from sort of my own my own head but i think really the key the key point i'd make about um the committee's activities is that um what we are ultimately concerned about is thinking first about the impact when you operationalize a statistical tool how is the output going to be handled and what consequences might that have for individuals. From a policing point of view, it's really intelligence, not fact. It doesn't provide any facts about individuals. It provides um, uh, an inference or a piece of intelligence in policing terms. So where will it be used? How will it be disclosed? What, what happens if it might if it turns out to be wrong or misleading. All those things that we need to be thought about first, at, at really at the design phase of your, of your project. And this is because um, the, the use of um, statistical tools, um, machine learning within policing can't be unlinked from the human rights um, implications of the police actions that results from um, that from the use of the tool, from the use of the output, um, and I think what the um, committee activities and, and debates show is really an opera operation. I still can't say that word of the human rights necessity test in law, which which requires us to think about: is there a pressing social need? i.e., you know, is there a policing reason for doing this? Um, are the measures, is the tool connected to it, rationally connected to it? It can really only be rationally connected to it if if it works <laughs> and it's actually, you know, statistically valid. Um, are the measures no more than necessary? Um, you know, what are the potential consequences of doing it this way that might actually, um, you know, give more of a downside to um, to the activity than than is is necessary and do the measures strike that fair balance between individual rights and the interests of the community so again that that needs um, needs you to think about um, what this tool is doing what what are the outputs that it's producing what consequences might occur from for individuals and it's really important that that we then think about how the proposed data analytics will be deployed in practice in order to really be able to answer that human rights necessity test um, accurately and to think about um, the whole life cycle of a tool, you know, not, not only uh, what it does when it's in a testing phase, but what happens when it's deployed? How do human police officers really react to it? How do they start using it in practice? Do they use it in a different way to the way it was anticipated? Um, and has it changed police practices in a way that wasn't an anticipated? So all of those things, I think, really um, highlight the need for a much more longer term um, uh, assessment of the impacts of, of statistical tools, not not uh, just an assessment um, that is looking at the statistical validity in rather of, of a vacuum. <clears throat> so I think um, this question of whether tools work in a in a in a policing context um, also uh, highlights the fact that. Perhaps the way that these tools are named is a little bit um, misleading. Um, we hear much about predictive risk assessments using machine learning methods um, in policing, often using some sort of random forest decision tree method. But, but I've always 
been slightly confused and question whether they are really predicting or risk assessing anything despite the way that they're badged. Um, this is because they use group data from the past to make a prediction about an individual's future. And so maybe they maybe it's more accurate to say that they are categorizing or comparing by comparison with certain characteristics of a group in the past and only those characteristics that can be um, translated into some sort of numeric scale or into a data point. Um, so they're really answering the question, how do the characteristics uh, of an individual, only those that can be translated into a data point, compare to the characteristics of a specified group of people in the past? And, and putting it that way sounds a little bit less impressive, <laughs> but also perhaps a bit more realistic. Um, so I think we need to be much clearer in this context about um, what these tools are doing and what and what therefore questions they can answer and what questions they can't answer. And this is also because, um, as in many contexts, we, we know that data recorded within um, police systems can be partial, it can be entered in different formats, it can be out of date or just missing. Um, for example, um, a recent BBC report on Greater Manchester Police quoted one serving officer saying there's a black hole where recent intelligence should be because basically that the, the information is just not being entered. Um, we, we know that there has been a lot of criticism recently about the police's handle, handling of, of violent crimes against women. Um, some, of, some of that information may just not be uh, categorised appropriately, might not, it might not be in the right systems, we might have uh, data in lots of different si systems that need, need to come together. So again, we have to be realistic about what can be achieved through this, um, th these forms of data analytics. Um, and especially what can be predicted about individuals based on based on this data, as opposed to more strategic, um, perhaps, um, uh, decisions. And then, um, again, uh, back to this question of do they work? Um, I'm sure, um, I you, you're all much more aware of this than I am, but of course, um, High, the high accuracy rates that are often quoted about uh, in respect to these types of tools can also conceal very low accuracy rates for specific individuals. Um, I like to illustrate this by um, my blue-headed parrots here. Uh, the the tool might uh, my work for them, but what about my red hat uh, head, headed friend here? Um, the tool may be um, very inaccurate in respect of them. Um, and in other words, I like to quote my Sherlock Holmes <laughs> the way I try and understand these things. Um, uh, Sherlock Holmes in one of the stories said that while the individual man is an insoluble puzzle in the accurate in the aggregate, he becomes a mathematical certainty. You can never foretell what any man will do, but you can say with precision what an average number will be up to. And I, I, I do think that we need to keep that in mind when thinking about how these tools can be used in respect of individuals um, in a policing context. A practical example of that is... Um, uh, and I, I'm, I imply no criticism at all of any of the authors of this uh, tool, but it's just an example of uh, a statistical measure that um, maybe has some use in certain contexts, but not in others, as the authors acknowledge. Um, a tool called OxRec, which is the Oxford Risk of Recidiv Recidivism, that's another word I can't say, tool, um, which is designed to be an interface um, for calculating individual risk levels um, for offenders and is um, currently under evaluation by the College of Policing and I think Thames Valley Police. 
And it does incorporate such factors as immigration status and neighbourhood deprivation of where the individual lives. Um, the authors themselves um, quote a positive predictive value of between 21 and 37 percent and state that the tool has low predictive accuracy at the individual level. So they, you know, they, they, will say, they say in their article that um, preventative dissension wouldn't be justified on the basis of using this sort of statistical tool. Um, arguably, um, many other policing actions may not be justified on the basis of that sort of um, accuracy level as well. So I think, I think we do have to bear in mind that um, these tools are, are being built, they are um, being badged as um, something that can cal calculate individual risk levels, but we have to be very careful about what decisions are made um, as a result of them. Another reason why um, we have to think about the um, what these tools are doing and what they're not doing is to make sure that we are ensuring that uh, we are answering the question that we need to answer and we're not conflating um, algorithmic outputs with the answer to legal tests. Uh, just uh, put an example here of um, a, a legal test. Um, on the screen uh, in the UK's Police and Criminal Evidence Act, uh, which is talking about uh, how you make a decision as to whether somebody should be released after charge or not, with or without bail. Um, a person should be released unless the custody officer has reasonable grounds for believing that the detention of the person arrested is necessary to prevent him from committing an offence or causing physical injury to another person or various other reasons. Now, it might be easy to think, oh, well, we'll just use a sort of OxRec type algorithm and calculate the risk of somebody um, uh, uh, committing another offence and, and use it to decide that test. But actually, that test is not asking you to do that. The question is not whether an individual is in the high risk category according to one of those types of algorithms. It's actually much more nuanced if we read it and it requires a judgment around whether detention is necessary for one of these reasons. There might be all sorts of other um, things going on in that person's life that means that detention is not necessary for, um, for, to prevent them from committing an offence. This, this concept of reasonable grounds is, is something that appears in the law a lot. Um, reasonable grounds for suspicion um, to allow a police officer to stop and search somebody or um, arrest somebody. And it's very clear that um, generalizations or some sort of stereotypical image of a person or a, a type of person um, cannot be used to support reasonable suspicion. Um, and uh, this is something that uh, I know David Powell who's on the call might like to comment on a bit a bit later. Um, so again, I think we we need to think about whether the outputs from a statistical tool that is based on probabilities or based on, uh, putting somebody in a reference class could ever be used to justify reasonable grounds for suspicion, or would it fall within this exclusion of generalization or stereotypical images? I suspect it would. And so, uh, although um, uh, algorithmic tools can very much inform police activities in terms of producing intelligence or producing leads, for example. If you're going to engage in some sort of coercive action against an individual, stop and search um, being an example of that, um, I think we, we definitely need to be um, very careful about assuming that the output of a statistical tool is all that we need in those circumstances. Facial recognition is, is another good example there. Um, we tend to uh, 
summarise the outputs of facial recognition tools as it's a match, hooray, you know, we can go off and, you know, go and catch that person. But I've, I've put on the, on the slide here um, uh, a quote from an article that I found which actually describes what a facial recognition tool is doing um, I'll read it out, um, but I won't read out all the various Greek letters that were included in the calculations because that would be beyond me, I'm afraid. Um, facial uh, recognition decision in one of these tools is the idea of matching in any one facial component value of a test face image as corresponding to the facial component value of the reference database images using any two or three statistical tools out of five statistical tools such as blah, 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 and any three points out of nine points of geometric distance values with the help of logical and conditional operators and appropriate threshold values such as various Greek Greek letters. And I think that just illustrates that it's, it's not as simple as just saying a match. Um, we, we have it's, there's, there's a human decision there as to where to fix the threshold and, and how, um, according to the calculations, the, the software will indicate a match. And of course, uh, we may find that the facial recognition tool was only trained on photographs of white male adults during the daytime. And that's um, been something that's been hugely problematic uh, in facial recognition systems. I mentioned earlier that um, a lot of the uh, projects that have come before the West Midlands Police Committee um, have not necessarily been predictive, but have actually been more about network analysis and, and producing uh, intelligence, which I think have been perhaps the most valuable tools and, and most potential, potentially beneficial tools that, that we've seen bringing together data sets and, and trying to connect, you know, connect the dots and find the, the connections between individuals and, and potential uh, crimes and crime groups. But again, we do have to be careful with the way these tools are being visualized as, you know, big dots and, and, and links between, between individuals. Um, because behind that is our assumptions made and decisions made about what crimes, what type of data uh, goes into those systems. Um, some of them will include um, intelligence, uh, and and that and that could include intelligence that is categorised as unreliable. That might not be very obvious if you're just looking at the big dot. Um, it might include categories uh, which, which are called non-crimes, which are now recorded in police systems, um, which are, are non-incidents uh, that can't be categorised as a crime, but are being recorded because of a potential link to um, uh, hate incidents. But again, they they could, if if they might create a misleading impression if they're not handled appropriately. So I think it's really important to to really try and um, get underneath the big dot and and see um, how these calculations are being made. What does what does the big dot mean? What do, what do people think it means? Um, and is it clear to those using the system what they are looking at um, and and how they should use um, the outputs of these systems? And really importantly, um, are they confident uh, that this, if this was ever challenged, um, that you could explain all of this to a judge and um, the family of a victim who potentially might have been missed because they, they weren't in the big dot, they were sort of further down the list. So I, I think this, um, all of this, um, I'm sorry, slightly uh, uh, rambling really really emphasise emphasises to me that in order to create a, or a generate a trustworthy use of new technologies by policing, we need this three pillar approach. Um, law, a clear law that has guidance in, interpreted for the relevant policing context, uh, but really important in the middle here 
scientific standards and standards about the use of um, statistics, the use of data science, but really appreciate that policing context and can help um, police officers understand what they are looking at when they when they receive these um, calculations. And uh, on the other side here, um, people who um, are suitably trained and skilled and accountable um, to um, to to really appreciate all this and appreciate the need for those those standards to be applied. Um, my, the committee that I chair is called an ethics committee, but I think we do we do sort of more than ethics really. Although ethic, ethical debate within the committee has been really important for reflective practice and, and, and exploring where the boundaries should lie, um, I don't think we want to leave it all to ethics. Um, this is a quote on the slide here from Susan Lotord from her book, and she talks about the ethics edge is the line where the law no longer guides and protects us, leaving ethics as the lone standard. I don't think we want to get to that. We don't sort of drop off the ethics edge. Um, and in fact, I think we need we need the law and the scientific validity to come in first because and the ethics to guide, um, guide how we deal with that. But we can't uh, leave it all to ethics. The scientific side is so important here, and it links so so clearly to the um, uh, you know to how we interpret the human rights tests and how uh, policing should use these systems. So that the, my final thought is that we are really in in it together. We're all all in this together. Um, the technical and statistical aspects of data analytics can't be isolated from the legal and operational and policing and ethical considerations as each will influence the other. And really importantly, um, each will influence how we should evaluate um, statistics, data science and AI in the longer term and, and how, it, how it's used in, in the, in the policing, policing context. So I think I think I'll stop there before I run out of voice, um, and I'll stop the slides. There we go. Yeah. So we already have a question <coughs> from Jane. Um, you want to see the video as well, Jane, so that I can see. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's uh, very interesting to hear what's uh, been happening in that. Um, I'd be interested to know to what extent the West Midlands Ethics Committee has paid attention to all the work that's been done for 40 or more years in medicine, which actually addresses very many of the same issues. Um, I guess the difference is medicine started with statistics rather than machine learning. Um, but there's extensive work on what a prognostic index is. And the other question that occurred to me um, you're saying we need to be very careful about these tools, and I entirely agree with you, but what is your alternative? It's very easy to criticise the tools and assume that whatever else you're doing is better, but it's not self-evident to me. Um, so I'd be interested to know that. I'd also be interested to know, um, I think the idea that the law guides and protects us and ethics is beyond that. I mean, laws can be very unethical. Um, it seems to be somewhat dodgy to try any kind of separation like that. At any point, both the law and the ethics, and indeed the science, will depend on one's underlying view of the world. Um, so how do you see that integration working? Yeah, I'll start with that and I'll work backwards. <laughs> um, no, my... my, my uh, my three pillar approach, as you may have seen um, from the slide, does not does not have that separation. In fact, it has have ethics very much incorporated into that three pillar approach. And having chaired the ethics committee for the last three years, I'm actually very strong believer in in the benefits that that ethical review has actually achieved. But I think it is a, it is a combination of 
different things that we're doing within that ethics committee. Um, there is an ethical um, consideration of the consequences of using using these tools and and the consequences of not using them um, compared with the the current um, ways of doing things. Um, but it is also uh, highlighted to me that the the science and and the law integrate very much with that those considerations. So there is a very much of a combined approach within that committee. Um, in terms of not doing um, the data science, um, I actually agree. I'm very supportive of um, a lot of these initiatives that are going forward. And I, I've um, been very much impressed with some of the, the benefits that have um, come from integrating a data analytics approach and combining data sets because you can basically see new information about vulnerabilities um, and other issues. Uh, what, what we do need to do, however, is make sure that they are being properly evaluated and um, the uh, what what we're perhaps missing in in the policing context at the moment is is methods of evaluating, and that's actually something that I think we could potentially learn from the medical context. Is actually learn um, and integrate uh, more systematic methods of evaluation, and that's um, something that I suspect will come out in some of the uh, more recent debates around around this. Well, basic so, randomised controlled trials and, and adopting yeah. the same standards. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. So hopefully I've, I've covered all your questions. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much, Jane. Uh, Eugenie? Hi, yeah. So um, that was really a fantastic talk. Thank you. Um, really great. Um, and so I'm trying to put my hand down and it's not working. There it goes. <laughs> so um, I'm just uh, taking on an EDI role with um, the Royal Statistical Society starting, uh, I don't know whether it starts now or in January, I'm not quite clear on that, but um, one, of the, one of the things that I, I would really like, and I think that there's a, a lot of uh, already momentum in the society to, to take on is issues around EDI and algorithmic bias. Right. Um, and one of the main things that would be, I think it's important for, for the society to think about is how do we educate our students and how do we educate our researchers on how, you know, on, on, I mean, I think that on the one, you know, on the one hand, there are sort of the statistical tests we can imagine talking about, right? But I think that there's been a lot flagged up in your work and in other people's work about, um, the need to to do effective communication, to be working in teams, not to be thinking of it as something that your group does here and then feeds there, but that it needs to be. So, how uh, you know what what would you recommend as some sort of main things that we should consider, either providing in in a course for statisticians as part of our professional um, training, or you know trying to develop materials for people to integrate into their undergraduate teaching. I think that's, that's a great question and um, yeah it's something that I think if, I think a case study in you know, a case study approach might be um, really interesting for students um, um, I'm just just thinking about the the committee proceedings I mean all all of the papers for example are available online oh, uh, you know all publicly available um, including some rather long, um, <laughs> long documents, you know, explaining the ins and outs of, you know, the methods behind some of these Do you, projects. Could you put a link in there? Yeah, I'll, I'll put a link. Um, so it, it, for students, it, you know, giving them an example of here's a real life project for, uh, you know he, go away and read this 60 page document, which the committee members have to, um, every three months, um, and you know, think about how it would be used in practice. You know, what 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 would you do, or you know, how do you think they're using the right methods? You know, what are the implications of a police officer taking the output, for example? I mean, that that might be an interesting way of just getting um, students to start to think about the real 
the real life implications of of using different methods uh, because the data lab often is thinking about different methods and they will experiment with different methods and put their conclusions in the papers um, and and why they've chosen a particular type of method yeah uh, so so i mean that might be a, a, a way of incorporating incorporating that yeah that would be great and maybe jane could suggest um some suitable case studies also from um from medicine because of course that's another area that you know that bias can come in and you know there are all the you know well-known story about um more ill uh, less wealthy people being recommended for uh, less treatment than more wealthy, less ill people, right? Based on the fact that, that that's what they'd gotten in the past, right? So, um, I think what's important, I mean, we've got our students doing um, a project on stop and search data uh, and thinking about bias. But the first thing you have to do is define what you mean by bias. So, the statistics and the law section, which I chair at the moment, did produce a detailed discussion of the problems with um, knee-jerk responses to algorithms. Um, and yes, I've certainly taught uh, ethics for actuarial science, where I've uh, challenged students to take a scenario and write about it from presenting both sides of the issue from at least two or three of the major ethical theories. I mean, I don't buy into, the, the US seems to believe in medicine that the ethics started in 1960 in the United States, which uh, is not entirely accurate. Um, Didn't everything come from the United States? <laughs> right. So, yes, I mean, I, you know, I've written quite extensively on stats and ethics, and certainly the medical, medical world has quite a lot on that. But I think one of the most important messages we can have is that you have to decide what you mean by bias, because we have a strict statistical definition which writes in lots of assumptions, but you can change what your algorithm's doing by changing the question. And that simply isn't well enough understood. What is the question? Yeah. Jane, I'd love to talk to you more about this. I'm just trying to wrap my head around who at the Royal Statistical Society and which groups um, we should be bringing together to try to, to, to put this stuff together. So I'll definitely be in contact with you. Thank you. Yes. And um, we were trying to figure out here at EPFL what we should teach students about uh, writing a request to review board as as and figure it like because technical um, training normally doesn't include any notion of human subjects data and being careful and all of that. So I, I think it's very much in the air. And apart from medical, the other set of statisticians who know something is social science statisticians. Uh, Jane, did you have an additional question? Because you put your hand up. Sorry, no, that was that was just the, the follow on. OK, thank you very much. Sophia, the other Sophia. <laughs> <laughs> You're not talking to yourself. That's OK. Um, so it was, first of all, Marion, always lovely to hear the latest of your work, actually. So that's uh, brilliant to see. Um, and I think to the point of what to teach people, um, and Sophia will have heard me say this many times again, so apologies for repeating myself in some respects, but I think there's, an in, there's some basic principles which are really important to hardwire into people's thinking in the same way as when you train to be a statistician or uh, there are some basic rules upon which to build. In the same way, when it comes to things like EDNI, actually, ultimately, what you're talking about there is the human rights framework. And actually, that in of itself is one of the core and the underpinnings of a rule of law framework. And I think unless people understand that at a very philosophical, basic level, <laughs> the rest just falls to pieces because actually, Jane, you talked about um, bias meaning a certain thing in statistics. And actually, years ago, Sophia and I did a piece together. I remember doing a whole session on how do we define fairness? Because the differences of the ways in which our taxonomies relate to that matter, right? So bias and statistics is not the same as social science and rule of law biases. You know, the opportunity cost in human rights terms is not quantified in the same way as you might quantify it in, in statistics. And I think in order to 
then make sense of the case studies, the vignettes that Marion spoke about, using those to bring to life real life examples. I love that rather than just burying people in, in kind of like oodles of case law or something. Um, actually, there's a basic fundamental level of understanding that needs to be built in there. And I think there should be a 101 class in anyone who ever wants to do anything in statistics that impinges upon or touches on the real world, whether it be in policing or whether it be um, uh, applications that will apply themselves in the private sector. So banking provision, for instance, I used to head a strategy at the FCA, the financial services regulator. Um, the ways in which we deploy statistical techniques now actually impinge on absolutely every aspect of life. And to divorce these as being, well, we just build an statistics frame and then we hand it over to someone to apply it and they should then think about it, actually misses the opportunity to really cost fertilise some thinking here. So I would say if there was a sort of starter pack <laughs> of uh, curricula that really needs to be built in. because um, I And I also think people find it thoroughly interesting. Like they yeah. won't have touched any of this since GCO. You know, it's like in the UK, your educational track deviates at the age of 15. It's unlikely they will have looked at the Magna Carta or any of the precedences for the way in which we develop the human rights framework. It, it, it's not to say they should know, but we should be educating people who now, as Sophia said, when we were preparing, if you did maths thinking you didn't have to deal with social ills, that time's long gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. Right. I think that's really um, important. Well, I think I'm going to come back to you as well, Sophia, then, because as I said, I think we're really, um, I'm going to try to pull together, you know, a working group or advisory group, uh, possibly one of each, <laughs> uh, to think, as I said, in the first instance, probably for what we could put together for a short course to be offered by the Royal Statistical Society as part of its professional training, professional development and professional training. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also, I yeah, I was just going to say, I know that... Um, Birmingham have established a MSc in Responsible Use of Data Science. Oh, okay. It's actually designed for your reverse cohort. It's for legal practitioners who are moving into the use of data science, and it's designed to help um, them understand good use of data and responsible use of data. But it might just be worth connecting with that team because I think there's quite a lot of... It, it does need to be connected because, of course, the stats in the law section knows how how... Uh, knows the range of understanding of statistics by the legal profession, which is very wide. Um, I'd also say that, you know, what I, I would like to think, you mentioned the Magna Carta, which was very, one of its concerns was the rights of women and widows. Um, but I think one thing that people are not necessarily aware of is the origins of human rights. They're not universally accepted. Precisely. It's far from true that everybody is signed up to human rights. Um, and, you know, again, one, one can think quite a lot. Um, it would be good, I think, to decide just how broadly you're willing to think. I mean, with bias, you've got two different views. You've got the informal description of the ways in which bias can arise. And then you need a very formal understanding of that to evaluate things against. Um, and I think awareness of, did a project many years ago on socio cultural context for the ethics of randomized controlled trials. And I think that is quite important to bear in mind that human rights are not universal. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you want the other point of view as well, uh, not the medical or legal, but social science, someone like Fiona Steele at LSE is probably good to add in as well. Um, what, what was that perspective? Sorry, I'm just taking notes. Uh, so people who are used to dealing with human subjects data. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so social statistics. Um, yeah. So the person I would know is Fiona Steele from LSE. Is that with an E? Yes. I mean, of course it is, but S-T-E-E-L-E? -E -E? Yes, three E's. <laughs> three E's. <laughs> yes. The mathematician in, in me can't avoid. <laughs> so... Uh, do we have any more questions or shall we take a five minute comfort break uh, before uh, Alex sets up? Do we have any more? 
comments. There doesn't need to be questions. Can I always have more comments and questions. Um, I don't know whether any of you are familiar with the uh, document that was produced by the National Institute of Standards this summer in the United States. It's a sort of draft proposal for the, let me see if I can find it, for the recognition and mitigation of bias or something. Let me, let me see what it is. Uh, what it put put the link in the in the chat. yeah um, a proposal for identifying and managing bias in artificial intelligence, but it talks a lot about um, sort of communication. And one of the things that it mentions also is the need to communicate with people who will be affected on the end, <laughs> um, and to bring their voices into the discussion. Um, Anyway, they, uh, it's, I, I'm not going to try to summarize it, but it's, I think it's a pretty nice framework. Um, and at the moment, also, it's still, um, I think that they're still taking feedback on that. Um, so I think it would be really helpful if, you know, if you feel inclined to read through it and provide some feedback, I'm sure that would be super valuable to them as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, well, given I don't see any more hands, uh, we are now going to have a th three minute <laughs> comfort break. Uh, I'll, I'll remain here so nothing gets disconnected. Uh, and then Alex uh, is our next speaker. Thank you. Well, Alex Shuldershova, I hope I didn't butcher, butcher your name too much. Perfect. Uh, Estella Loomis, uh, Associate Professor in Statistics and Public Policy. Uh, she is on the executive committee of the ACM Conference on Fairness Accountability, um, and she has a joint project with a partnership on AI as well, uh, and did some of the very early, extremely interesting work on fairness and algorithms. And that's how I first uh, got to know your name, actually. Um, so she will... Um, speak um, today. If you could put up your slides so I don't uh, get caught by any changes of titles. <laughs> <laughs> Counterfactual predictions for real applications. And um, to keep bandwidth, I think we're, we'll all uh, switch our video off and um, turn off the sounds for ourselves. Thank you. Please get started. Fantastic. Thanks, Sophia. Um, just to double check, can everyone hear me and can everyone see a full screen version of my slides? I can hear you and I can see a full version. Everyone else has switched their sound off so they can't tell you. Fantastic. I'll, I'll assume that that's a yes then. Um, so, hey everyone. So, I'd love to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak today. And also thanks to everyone who's uh, stuck around or joined in um, to attend. So, in today's talk, I'll be picking up on some of the themes and concepts that uh, Marion has already introduced. Specifically, I'll focus on a common pitfall and how certain kinds of algorithmic tools are trained and evaluated. And I'll also present a statistically sound alternative that's been part of my work with um, my PhD student, Amanda Costin, and other collaborators. So throughout this talk, I'll be discussing risk assessment instruments, which uh, Marion has already introduced, but I'll just make a formal definition here so we're all on the same page. Um, these are algorithmic tools or statistical models, commonly logistic regressions, that estimate the likelihood that a person or a case will go on to have poor outcomes. These sorts of tools are used widely to inform decisions in domains such as lending, child welfare, criminal justice, healthcare, and other settings. And while all of the domains that are represented on this slide, at least, are ones in which I'm currently doing work to some extent, today's talk is going to focus primarily on the child welfare context, though there's really nothing about the methodology that doesn't readily apply to these and many other settings. Um, so with that, let me give you a bit of background on the U.S. child welfare system in our call screening work in Allegheny County. So when I started this work, one of the things I was really surprised to learn about is just the expansiveness of the system. Um, I was personally surprised to learn that over one in three U.S. children experience a Child Protective Services investigation by the age of 18. In 2018 alone, which is one of the most recent years for which we have uh, reliable statistics and reports available, child welfare agencies received an estimated 4.3 million referrals that involved 7.8 million children and three and a half million of those children received an investigation or some form of alternative response following the referral. Um, 
it looks like there's a bunch of noise outside. So hopefully my microphone is doing a good job of uh, noise filtering. Uh, please let me know if this becomes an issue. So now the challenge in handling child abuse referrals is that their content can be really vague and inconclusive, leading call workers uh, to have in insufficient information to determine which referrals should be investigated by caseworkers. And while rich administrative data is available as a source of supplementary information in many jurisdictions, there's really no assurance that this data is being used effectively or systematically. And this is where algorithmic tools, at least in principle, can help. So in this talk, I'll describe some of my research um, that I've been doing with many collaborators across domains, such as uh, economics, statistics, machine learning, design, and human-computer interaction, um, as part of developing, evaluating, uh, and engaging the community um, in algorithmic risk assessment tools in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. The first tool that the county developed went into deployment in August 2016, which is actually shortly before I joined the research team, just a couple of months before. And so far, we've been seeing some fairly positive results, though nothing really monumental. Um, by the way, if you're wondering where Allegheny County is, um, it's the county that contains Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University, which is the institution uh, where I work and teach. So our effort, while we've been seeing some positive results and we've had some uh, independent evaluations um, indicating that perhaps things are improving, the effort has also attracted considerable criticism. So Virginia Eubanks, notably in her book, Automating Inequality, has argued that the model mistakes parenting while poor for poor parenting. And Richard Rexler, who's an outspoken critic of data-driven methods and child welfare writ large, has written many scathing pieces, uh, both about the call screening tool um, that I'll be describing, and also a new at birth model that went into deployment last year, um, calling this an effort to go full Orwell. So at the end of the day, um, I'm uh, one of the people who expresses some level of techno-optimism. Um, I do believe that algorithmic decision support tools, if appropriately conceived and vetted um, and uh, developed through participatory design mechanisms, um, they are tools that can help workers in the child welfare system to better protect children and support families while minimizing undue burdens that the system can impose. But to succeed in the same, we need systems that are reliable, trustworthy, and trusted, which are already many of the themes that Marion had raised in her talk. Um, I could quote Marion here, but I'll quote someone else just for variety. So the issues uh, that we've raised so far really go deeper, in my view, than compliance with laws and regulation. So as Haytan Shah put it um, in a recent article, there is enormous opportunity for positive social impact from the rise of algorithms and machine learning, but this requires a license to operate from the public based on trustworthiness. We've seen before in the case of genetic modification what can happen when science is pushing forward but loses public trust. In the case of GMO, this set the take-up of the science back uh, significantly. And I think we're at a similar moment um, in, in the context of artificial intelligence. We accept it for many tasks, but perhaps not the most socially consequential ones. Um, and there is a chance that no matter how many techno-optimists we have in the crowd and uh, how hard we work to make our, truth, our models trustworthy, we might not garner trust from the public. But for the remainder of this talk, I'll focus on an underappreciated reason for why standard approaches to building and evaluating risk assessments fail to produce trustworthy and reliable results in the first place. And I'll offer some solutions. So um, let me tell you a bit more about the process of developing risk assessment tools to assist call screening decisions. And I'll focus here on Allegheny County. Things differ depending on the data resources available in any given jurisdiction. So in Allegheny County, when a child abuse referral comes in, call workers have access to two categories of information. They get to learn the allegation and they get to look up rich multi-system administrative records for all children and adults associated to the referral call using the county's integrated data system or IDS. This is sometimes also called their data warehouse. And call workers are tasked with using this information to decide whether a referral should be screened in, um, which is synonymous with investigated, or screened out, which you can think of as recorded in the system but not followed up on. So the integrated data system contains rich information, including things like criminal justice involvement, public assistance use, behavioral health and substance abuse treatment, at least for uh, county-funded services. Um, and child welfare history and demographics, among many other things. 
However, the issue is that this information is simply too rich for a call worker to systematically and efficiently process. Um, if it helps for you to think of the scale of data in terms of the number of columns or features in a data set, uh, there are over 800 features uh, on each referral. And this is where risk assessment tools enter in. So developing a risk assessment tool amounts to constructing a model that uses this information X in our integrated data system uh, to predict the likelihood of some adverse outcome. So the standard, what we call observational approach, does this by just looking at the historical data and taking Y to be some proxy for harm, such as substantiation uh, of the allegation re-referral, um, removal from the home, hospitalization on child abuse related code, something like that, and regressing it on the Xs, the features that are available in the administrative data. As I'll discuss now, this observational approach to model training results in models that are not reliable. So while this is the uh, most common approach, this is not one that we advocate people to use. It, and the issue is that while these models may be informative about historical decision making and outcomes, they're ill suited to guiding future decisions. So let me illustrate that with an example. So the problem is that observational models fail to make decision relevant distinctions. So let's consider here the case of a girl who's shown in the first row whose risk of adverse outcomes according to this model is 0.97. And perhaps this is even an oracle model. So um, it's as good as we can get. And then we have a boy in the bottom row whose risk is just 5%. So now let's ask the question of should we investigate these cases? In the first case, uh, the model tells us that the girl is at an extremely high risk of poor outcomes. Um, and so, yes, we should investigate. Uh, this child is at high risk of harm. How about in the second case? So one might be inclined to apply similar reasoning and say no because the child is at low risk of harm. But that's actually not right. So we might want to investigate this child anyway because the child may be at high risk of harm if we don't. So the problem is that these observational models that assess harm in the observed data tell us who is at high risk under the historical decision-making processes. So in particular, such models do not distinguish between children who are generally low risk. These are children who we would not want to investigate. And those who are low risk precisely because they're the types of kids we've historically been identifying as high risk and successfully targeting with risk mitigating interventions. So, um, this risk could be 5% because if we stop intervening on children such that are represented by this boy here, their risk would be much higher. But we have successfully identified them and intervened in the past. And we can see this sort of issue in practice. So shown here is the risk distribution for an observational model trained to predict the likelihood of re-referral uh, within six months for four different subgroups of children in the historical data. So the first subgroup is those who were screened out or not investigated, and that's the green curve. Basically, I'm plotting the p-hats or estimated probabilities of re-referral uh, for four groups of children. The second group is that is the yellowish group. So those are those who were investigated. The purple group uh, with this lowest risk distribution is those who were provided with services intended to stabilize families and mitigate risk. And this uh, dark orange curve over here is those who were removed from the home and placed in foster or kinship care. And what we see here is that what this observational model does is it, uh, it produces a risk distribution so that for those who receive services, this pink curve to which the arrow points, those had among the lowest estimated risk levels. And this is likely because those services help to mitigate risk as they are constructed to do, rather than a systematic error in offering services primarily to already lower risk families. So following the, rec the recommendations of such a model would result in families who typically benefit from services no longer being offered those services because they're not screened in at the outset. And furthermore, such recommendations might and in fact should degrade trust in the tool overall. So repeatedly seeing families who you know need services being recommended for screen out on the basis of a low risk assessment would rightly make you question the tool's reliability. So what we really care about is counterfactual risk. There isn't just one risk, there are at least two. So there's the risk if the child is screened in, if they're investigated, and the risk if they're screened out. So for the previous case, what we might have is the following. The first child may be at high risk regardless of what we do. Her risk may be 97% irrespective. 
But the second child may be at high risk if screened out, that is, if not investigated, but very low risk if uh, investigated and then provided with services. So what's the action that we would want to take in each case, um, given this information? So in the first case, our, our decision would not really change. We would want to investigate the child as a high risk of harm. But in the second case, the answer now is quite definitively yes as well. This child is at high risk of harm if we do not intervene. So when we look at our data, what we should have in mind is a potential outcomes view. There's some outcome that will be observed if the child is screened out, and a potentially different outcome that would be observed if the child is screened in. Only one of the decisions is observed to be taken historically. And what we get to observe, our why, our outcome, is just the potential outcome corresponding to the decision actually taken. So if we want to inform cause screening decisions, and you can think of a parallel story um, in the medical context where these issues are well understood, uh, or criminal justice, um, what we really want is a counterfactual model that estimates the risk of adverse outcomes under screen out. So observational models instead target the observed risk, which marginalizes inappropriately over the decisions historically taken. And what we really want is to target this counterfactual outcome. So the challenge, of course, is that we only get to observe what happens under screen out for the cases that were actually screened out, which may not be representative of all cases in the population. And this, for those of you who have worked with causal inference before, is the fundamental problem of causal inference. So we can compare the results of a counterfactual model that predicts risk under screen out. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how we obtain this. Um, to the observational model that we saw before. So the counterfactual model, which is now shown here in the top panel, assesses children who receive services following screen-in as being much higher risk than the other groups. Right? So that's the, the pink curve here. You'll see that um, the those who um, are placed in foster care and those who receive services, the groups that are most heavily intervened upon, now have the highest risk distribution if assessed as the risk under no intervention. So that same services group, that pink curve, is assessed as among the lowest risk by the observational model. That's the, what we saw before. And so these different modeling approaches result in very, very different risk assessment instruments and very different rankings. And so these issues that we're flagging regarding the commonly used observational approaches to training risk assessment models, they really do have considerable implications for practice. These aren't minute differences. These uh, significantly re-rank um, the individuals under observation. Okay. So similar pitfalls that we've just described in the model learning phase, so when we're developing our risk assessment tool, also impact model evaluation and fairness assessment. So the standard observational approach, which predicts the outcome why and evaluates against that observed outcome, not thinking about the impact of interventions, and assesses the predictive bias with respect to how well we are predicting or how equitably we are predicting that outcome, it gives us not the right information. So observational learning tells us the likelihood of adverse outcomes under the observed historical decisions. So perhaps it can tell us who's high risk despite the actions that we may have taken in the past, um, but it's not really informative for future decision making. Observational evaluation answers how well can we predict the observed outcomes of the historical decisions, not how well we can predict or in Marion's terms classify an individual based on their characteristics um, to a likely future outcome. And the predictive bias or fairness evaluation on the basis of the observed outcome tells us whether the model is a fair predictor of who experiences adverse outcomes under the historical process. Again, it's not really doing the sort of predictive tasks that we might want for decision making. So since I've talked about fairness very briefly, let me use this as an opportunity to detour into common ways of thinking about algorithmic fairness uh, to those of you who have uh, not uh, become familiar with this before. So there are many def definitions out there, and unlike in the privacy context that some of you might be familiar with, where we have notions such as differential privacy that seem to be broadly appropriate and have nice mathematical properties, algorithmic fairness is generally regarded as being context dependent. We don't have a single unified definition. So for notation, let's say we have a group indicator G, um, and so this could be, for instance, gender or race ethnicity, 
a continuous version of our predictor S. So let's say that this is one that outputs probabilities. This is our risk score, so S for score. And a classifier Y hat, which you can think of as being a thresholded version of S. So fairness through blindness or unawareness simply states that S and Y hat can't use G as an input. Right? So you can't use race or ethnicity as a direct input to the model. And this type of fairness that um, some might say that legal prohibitions against the consideration of race, gender, or other protected attributes would appear to require, though uh, it's actually not clear that that prohibition applies to tools in this sense. The notion of statistical demographic parity says that individuals from all groups should have the same likelihood of being classified as positive. So if we have some sort of threshold that we're classifying um, children above um, some threshold uh, on S, so at uh, so we're classifying children above some threshold um, to be high risk. Then what this is saying is that the proportion of children uh, classified as high risk should be the same for black families and white families. Right? So individual fairness um, is another criterion and this one looks a little bit different. It formalizes the intuition that similar people should be treated similarly. So it's essentially a Lipschitz condition, um, mathematically speaking. And here what you should envision is that you have some sort of metric on the space of potentially randomized decision functions S and a similarity metric D that tells us how similar two individuals are for the task at hand. So in a graduate school admissions process, D might place high weight on undergraduate GPA and math background while ignoring uh, characteristics such as age and athleticism. And so what you want to say is that individuals who are similar in terms of their similarity metric D also receive similar scores. The notion of calibration um, requires that the true outcome, so Y, be independent of group membership, G, given the predictor S. So in the credit scoring context, this would say something like the average likelihood of default is the same for all individuals who receive a particular score, irrespective of whether they're, say, male or female. So what the score didn't connotes about risk does not depend on what we might perceive to be irrelevant group characteristics. And lastly, error rate balance requires that the classification be independent of group membership conditional on the true outcome. So this is the same as saying that we want our false positive rate or our false negative rate to be the same across groups. And those of you who may be familiar with ProPublica's story on the Compass Criminal Risk Assessment Tool in Broward County, Florida, though that tool is used much more widely than that, might recognize error rate balance as precisely the fairness criterion that the investigation found to be highly violated. Now, there are many other definitions, each with their own motivation limitations. So why did I talk about all of these? Um, one is because if you haven't seen these before, it's useful to know what at least some of the definitions are. There are many dozens others. But what's important for our discussion is to observe that while a number of these definitions do not at all depend on our observed outcome, okay, some do, many others do. And in particular, the ones that are most commonly used in the context of evaluating risk assessment tools generally do depend on the target outcome Y. And so for definitions that do depend on this outcome, whether you consider algorithmic fairness with respect to the observed outcome, so the thing that's a process, that's a, that's a result of your uh, historical processes and may be impacted by uh, interventions, or a potential outcome under a precisely defined counterfactual decision, such as the likelihood of harm or re-referral in the case where we do not intervene, you'll get very different conclusions about the predictive bias properties of your tool. So what we propose in our work is a counterfactual approach, not just for learning, but also for evaluating and performing predictive bias assessments that ask the same sort of questions about learning, evaluation, and fairness in reference to a specific decision-relevant counterfactual. So in the call screening setting I've just described, this corresponds to focusing on a risk under screen out. So we are interested in assessing the likelihood that a child uh, will have adverse outcomes if there's no investigation, we want to understand how well our model predicts uh, individuals' outcomes under no investigation. And again, we want to assess the predictive bias with respect to this counterfactual. So the challenge, of course, is that this outcome is not observed for cases that are, uh, unless the case is not investigated. So if the case is investigated, we don't get to observe this outcome directly. 
So the analysis um, that we carry out in our in our work and our argumentation theoretically and empirically demonstrates the pitfalls of the standard observational approach. We show that observational learning underestimates the risk of those who are receptive to treatment. Observational evaluation may show superior performance for models that are poorly aligned with our decision-making goals and would find, for instance, that a perfect classifier of such a thing existed actually had a high false positive rate. And observational assessments of predictive bias, importantly, will mistake disparities in historical decision-making or treatment and intervention effectiveness for model bias. And these are things that are important to deconfound. And our paper presents ex uh, experiments on both synthetic and real-world child welfare data to show that the observational approaches can give very misleading conclusions. Um, we instead um, both draw attention to these issues and present doubly robust estimates of counterfactual versions um, of common evaluation and group-based predictive bias metrics used in risk assessment. And we demonstrate both theoretically and empirically how the sorts of fairness-promoting interventions um, that have been introduced in the machine learning literature that are typically geared to fixing observational disparities can actually make things worse and exacerbate or induce um, unfairness with respect to the decision-relevant counterfactual outcomes. So there's a fair bit of related work out there, both in the statistics um, and machine learning literature, and I'll just highlight a few more recent uh, references. So our work is related to the extensive um, existing literature on policy learning and evaluation in um, reinforcement learning and related fields. And doubly robust methods, which are the types of statistical tools that we rely on, have been proposed for these types of problems. The key difference between our work and this policy learning literature is that we are uh, is that in decision support contexts, we're not seeking to learn a policy that will autonomously take actions or even recommend actions. Um, indeed, research has shown that in most cases, users of these systems want the algorithm to provide information such as a risk score or some numeric score, traffic light uh, type of scale, rather than to recommend a particular action. So we are learning and evaluating probability estimates, not policies. Our work is also somewhat related to the recent work on counterfactual fairness, though the connection there is mostly in name rather than in specific methodology. And the key difference here is that the literature on counterfactual fairness considers counterfactuals of the protected attributes, such as race or gender, not of the decision taken. So those models are useful for understanding if, for instance, a decision or a model prediction would have been different, say, had a child gender been different, but we, on the other hand, are considering counterfactuals of the decision. And counterfactuals of attributes are viewed by many as ill-suited to the risk assessment context. So, for instance, in child welfare, we know that girls are more likely to be victims of sexual abuse, but we would not want in our modeling or assessment uh, to artificially deflate girls' scores or inflate boys' scores in assessing risk um, and in informing investigation decisions just to achieve some sort of parity um, with respect to gender in this way. So let me provide you now with a high level overview of the technical details of our identification and estimation strategy. So in our setting, the target quantity we wish to estimate is the likelihood of poor outcomes under the baseline intervention. So in this case is uh, saying, estimate for me the likelihood of say re-referral or some other outcome um, given characteristics X in the case where I am not going to intervene, right? So no investigation. So now we don't observe uh, why not in all cases. We don't observe the, uh, the outcome under no investigation unless the case was historically screened out. And even there, that's because of an identifying assumption. So to make this quantity identifiable, to be able to estimate this um, mu naught from our observed data, we're going to make three standard uh, identifying assumptions. The first is consistency, which says that the observed outcome um, is Y1 if uh, the child was investigated, Y0 if not. And this is the sort of um, assumption that's reasonable for us, but it can be unreasonable in vaccination studies where, for instance, your outcome depends not just on your vaccination status, but on the vaccination status of those around you. We'll also assume no unmeasured confounding, which says that we have measured in our features X um, everything that affects both the decision and the outcome. So conditional unmeasured features X, the historical treatment decision is as good as random. And this is often a strong assumption. Um, 
And in our setting, we know that call workers have information uh, on the call itself that is not recorded in our administrative data system and the features that we use. Um, but we actually have a fair bit of information that we could use to further test this assumption. In particular, we do have unstructured text, uh, text data as well. And we're curious to explore the, the soundness of this unknown measured confounding assumption. And lastly, we're going to assume weak positivity, which requires that, in all that all cases have some probability of being screened out. So there aren't any cases that are systematically screened in. And we know for a fact that in roughly 20% of cases, this assumption is violated. Um, that's because certain allegations, including those of sexual abuse, are legally mandated to be investigated. There's no discretion on the part of the call worker for allegations that are serious enough or fall into particular statutes. Those are simply excluded from our analysis because our risk assessment model wouldn't be used to inform decisions where there's no discretion in the first place. So for all other cases, we need the assumption to hold. So let me walk you through um, some of the technical details. So under those identifying assumptions, uh, we can learn a model um, to predict the counterfactual risk, so the likelihood of poor outcomes if we don't investigate, given um, the features X, just by using those cases that were observed to be screened out. But now, what if we are in a situation where not all confounding variables can be used in the prediction model? So instead of having no unmeasured confounding, which means we've measured all factors that jointly affect the historical decisions and the outcomes, and they, assuming that those are all reasonable inputs to the prediction model, we're actually going to uh, say that we're in the setting of runtime confounding. Right. So, in our 2020 paper, uh, we introduced runtime confounding to describe the setting where the features X that we have measured actually break down into two components, Z and V. So, Z are measured, but for one reason or another, cannot be used as inputs to our prediction model in real time. Our prediction model can only rely on features V. And I've just realized this is probably my first time uh, actually referring to the features as Z. I've become a proper American um, and have rid myself of the Canadian Z pronunciation. So, and uh, in time for uh, the right audience for this as well. So, runtime confounding can arise for a variety of reasons. So, perhaps Z or Z um, is very complex or high dimensional, such as um, if we have natural language in the hotline call. So if the resulting model is required to be simple or interpretable or easily calculable by a human, it may be undesirable to include those text features, even if that text data actually provides us with important information um, and important confounding information that uh, helps us to better model the decision. Or Z could be a sensitive feature like race, which may have influenced historical decisions and outcomes, but which is not permitted to be used in a risk assessment model. And as a final example, um, there could be timing issues in the process. So the decision process may necessitate that the risk score be made available to the decision maker before all other decision relevant features have been measured. Maybe we need to assess it early, um, even though other factors are known and later recorded that influence decisions. So what can so um, what can we do in this case to get a valid counterfactual model that predicts the likelihood of adverse outcomes? Um, using only features V at runtime. So one might think that a possible approach is just to regress Y on V in the cases where we observed um, a screen out, right? so where T equals zero. And the issue is that because the confounding variable Z are being ignored, this model is confounded in much the same way as the observational models we talked about at the start of the talk. So our proposal is based on noting that um, the risk given just the features V can be decomposed via the identifying assumptions um, I presented before uh, and uh, iterated expectations into a quantity that looks like uh, the counterfactual regression of our outcome on the full feature set V and Z, and then further projecting that down onto V. So what this suggests is basically a two-stage procedure where first we build a counterfactual model just to obtain pseudo outcomes based on Z and V combined, and then we regress those pseudo outcomes to project down onto just the features V. So essentially we build a counterfactually valid model and project that. Yeah. 
And in this case, Z is required only for training. And this is the part where we are using the fact that Z is necessary um, to ensure that we have no unobserved confounding. Um, but the final model relies only on V. And in our paper on runtime confounding, we describe several variants um, of this two-stage procedure in significant detail and provide theory and experiments to assess their performance. So now that we've discussed how to build these counterfactual risk assessment models, let's talk briefly about evaluation. How do we actually evaluate these models with respect to counterfactual outcomes rather than the outcome we observed historically? So in the evaluation and predictive bias assessment stage, we rely on doubly robust estimation strategies. There's actually a doubly robust flavor to some of the um, runtime confounding estimates that uh, we introduce in the paper as well. So we derive uh, formulas for the common quantities that arise in performance and uh, group-based fairness assessment and risk assessments. Um, so these are things like false positive rates, uh, false negative rates, calibration curves, ROC curves, area under the curve, um, all these sorts of quantities. And uh, just for those of you who are not familiar with doubly robust techniques, uh, which are widely used in the causal inference and uh, survey methods literature, I'll illustrate them here with a very simple example of estimating the prevalence of poor outcomes um, under no treatment. So here there are no Xs. I just want to give you some flavor of what does it look like to use a doubly robust method to estimate um, what fraction of children would go on to have poor outcomes if we didn't intervene with anyone, if we just ignored our calls altogether. So there are two commonly used estimators with which you may already be familiar. Um, and let me describe for you the plug-in estimator first. So the plug-in estimator uh, starts by constructing an estimate for our regression function, our counterfactual regression function that we had before. This may or may not be the same as our chosen risk model. It could be different because we don't have any structural constraints on uh, this just nuisance function that we're estimating for convenience, whereas we might require that our risk score S not include certain factors, that it be interpretable, um, et cetera. So we construct a prediction given X of the counterfactual um, outcome. And the plug-in estimate uh, is just going to average that uh, our estimate for any given individual, so an individual's estimated likelihood of poor outcomes under screen out um, over the entire population. All right, so this is the plug-in estimate. There's also the inverse propensity weighted approach, which improves upon the idea of simply calculating the prevalence for those observed to be screened out by reweighting that population, uh, those samples to look like the full population. So this is weighting by the likelihood of, of screen out. And then doubly robust estimation looks like a combination of these. So the doubly robust estimator you can think of as bias correcting uh, the plugin with this weighted propensity weighted bias correction term. So uh, this estimator is doubly robust in the sense that it is robust to misspecification of either the regression function mu naught appearing here um, or the propensity score function pi. And in a non-parametric model, it has faster rates of convergence um, than using the IPW or plug-in estimate alone. And furthermore, under sufficiently fast convergence of those nuisance functions, pi hat and mu naught, you can compute asymptotically valid uh, uh, normal confidence intervals for these doubly robust estimators. So in our work, what we do is we use this sort of strategy not just to estimate prevalence, um, but to estimate all the common evaluation metrics that are used to assess the predictive bias of risk assessment tools in practice. So um, let me now walk you through a quick example to illustrate um, the methods and to contrast the nature of the conclusions that one would obtain from the standard observational approach um, in comparison to the counterfactual one for which uh, we've advocated. So our data for the experiment is from Allegheny County, and this is data from 2010 to 2014, which was the original uh, training and validation data for the model that got deployed in 2016. Here we have uh, over 35,000 unique referrals to the hotline, and our features include things like criminal justice history, prior child welfare, history, substance abuse, demographic information, and course level allegation information. Our outcome of interest is going to be re-referral to the hotline within six months of the current call. 
And we're using random forest both for the observational and counterfactual models. And uh, we're also using it to estimate the nuisance functions, our mu hats and pi hats uh, that I illustrated uh, when discussing doubly robust estimation on the previous slide. So let me walk you now through the, uh, through the findings for a calibration assessment. So the questions that we are interested in asking here is, is the risk assessment model well calibrated? And is it equally well calibrated across groups? So on the x-axis, you will see the output that the model produces. And on the y-axis, you will see the observed outcome rate. Right? So what it means for a model to be well calibrated is that when I tell you that uh, I estimate the probability of re-referral within six months to be 40%. Then for individuals where I say 40%, their observed re-referral rate within six months is 40%. Right? So the diagonal line, if your calibration curve falls along this diagonal line, at least approximately, that's an indication of good calibration. Right? So what we're asking here in our predictive bias assessment is, does, uh, does the model overestimate risk for one population relative to another. Okay. So the columns here in this four panel plot indicate the type of evaluation that's being performed. We have observational evaluations that evaluate against our observed outcome Y and counterfactual evaluations that evaluate against our counterfactual outcome Y not. And all the results that I'm showing you here are based on a held out test set. So displayed now in the bottom left is the calibration plot that you would get from a standard observational analysis where you train an observational model that's indicated by being in the bottom row and you perform an observational analysis. And so now you're going to see whether the estimated probabilities match up with the observed rates. So this analysis tells us that except at very low probabilities maybe, and that could just be a blip, the model is about equally well calibrated across racial groups and overall quite well calibrated in the sense that the estimated probabilities align well with the observed rates. When we look at our counterfactual model, which was trained using the procedures I outlined previously, but we look at it through an observational evaluation lens, we find that it overestimates the likelihood of re-referral in the observed data. So when the probability is estimated to be 40%, the observed rate is maybe 30% for white children indicated in green and maybe 25% for black children indicated in uh, gray. And not only does the model appear to overestimate risk in the higher score ranges, it appears to do so more for black children than for white children. So in, in other words, this analysis suggests that the model is biased against black children. And now the issue that I want to draw your attention to here is that even when, um, when people build risk assessment models that are trained in a way that produces something that is counterfactual, they're often evaluating them against observational outcomes. So you would see this sort of miscalibration, not because your model is wrong, but because your evaluation strategy is not coherent with the goals of your model. So our counterfactual evaluation, which I've now populated in the second column, it tells a different story. So not only does it indicate that the counterfactual model is equally well calibrated across groups and calibrated overall, it confirms that our observational model underestimates risk for both groups. So for instance, when the model assesses the risk to be, let's say 20%, the actual observed risk is much closer to 30%, or counterfactual risk, sorry, is um, much closer to 30%. And the racial disparities that we saw previously um, are actually found uh, uh, are actually found to be due to differences in historical screening rates and the effectiveness of interventions in mitigating risk across groups. So what we saw in the top left panel under observational evaluation was actually getting the story mixed up between the predictive ability of our model and historical decision making and treatment effectiveness. So this last point is important, I wanna emphasize it. When we see this type of calibration as is shown and highlighted in the top left, our response is often to seek some sort of technical solution, um, some sort of post-processing or retraining approach to remedy it. But in this case, the observational disparity is not due to the model failing, um, it's in part due to investigations being more effective in mitigating risk for black children. 
So fairness correcting for the sort of disparity could lead to black children receiving lower scores and thus being underserved if those recommendations of the resulting tool are adhered to and those children wind up receiving uh, a lower rate of services to mitigate their risk going forward. So in our paper, we formally characterize when these sorts of fairness correcting interventions based on observational disparities produce counterfactual unfairness. So I'm not going to describe that here, but you do get some nice results that precisely point to uh, differences in historical uh, treatment assignment and intervention effectiveness as being the key components. So let me um, just end with a summary of the material that I've just presented, right? Every talk should uh, tell the audience what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you've told them. So in summary, the standard observational approach to learning and evaluating risk assessment tools, which is extremely widely used, is something that is ill-suited to supporting decisions. Firstly, it underestimates risk for those who benefit from interventions. It also assesses model performance and predicting outcomes under historical decisions, not under proposed or baseline decisions, which is precisely what we need for the purpose of guiding decision-making going forward. And it also mistakes disparities in historical decision-making or intervention effectiveness with model bias, and critically applying fairness correcting methods on the basis of observed disparities using that classical observational approach can actually induce or exacerbate um, inequities and unfairness in future decisions. So in addition to highlighting those shortcomings of the standard approach, we do a couple of things. So we develop a method for training counterfactual models under runtime confounding. We present doubly robust estimates of counterfactual versions of the sort of evaluation and predictive bias metrics that people tend to evaluate in the context of risk assessment tools. And we also demonstrate theoretically and empirically how applying fairness correcting methods to fix observational disparities can induce or exacerbate counterfactual unfairness. And just um, the second to last thing I'll say is that the sort of work that we've done here contributes to producing tools that are more reliable and trustworthy, but getting the users in affected communities to trust them is a very different story. And that's something that I absolutely don't have time for in this talk, but it's another important component of my research agenda in this space. So um, I'd like to thank the multidisciplinary research team of collaborators and students across computer science, statistics, economics, social work, and design um, who have made this and all our other work in the child welfare context possible. Um, and I'd love to hear any questions, comments, any discussion. And thank you once again for having me here. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions for Alex? Please put your hand up if you have questions. Um, so often my understanding of counterfactual methods is that you have to put in a lot of assumptions to make up for the fact that you're solving a very hard problem and you're acknowledging it. Um, so when you talk about robustness, how far do you get in being robust to assumptions? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. Um, we have some work in, in progress that tries to study the robustness question more directly. Um, so to see just how wrong our conclusions might be if some of our assumptions are wrong. Um, our approach to thinking about the robustness question or assumptions so far has actually been to go and to talk to the call worker staff and to watch them make decisions and to have them perform think aloud exercises and to get some sense of how are they making decisions. So there are things that we obviously can't capture about their decision making process um, and those things might fall under the category of noise. These aren't confounding factors that influence both their decision and um, provide them some insight into the likely outcome that we're trying to forecast for the case, but it's things like the person had a bad day or the previous, or they've just screened in a bunch of cases and that's not what they usually do. And so they might have a bias to screen out the next one, but that that's all around, that's all around noise. So what we're really concerned about is, are we capturing the sort of factors that they think about? Um, and the things that we might miss is some information that comes through on the allegation that isn't simply its nature or information about prior referral history. Um, I, 
I don't have numbers for you about how wrong we might be, but we feel pretty good um, that we're at least doing our best in this um, this analysis of the text notes where the call workers further justify their historical decisions. Once that's complete, I think it'll give us a much clearer sense because they really do document the things that they took into account, not all of which are available in the administrative records that we've analyzed so far. Is there anyone who studied whether people self-censor because they're not supposed to take this into account, but their human experience would call them the truth? That's right. Um, so I don't, I don't have any hard data or anic data about that question, but I think it's a really interesting one. Um, and it's one that has come up when we even put in the proposal to analyze um, the case note uh, free text data. Um, we, uh, in going through the consent process with our IRB, a uh, big point that we had to address is not ever obtaining informed consent from the child welfare staff because we were concerned that knowing that their notes were now being scrutinized and scrutinized at scale by a research team might actually change their recording practices, which is not what we want institutionally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Eugenie, I think you were before Jane. I think Jane was first. Okay, Jane then, sorry. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, very nice talk, thanks, Alex. And in fact, Sophia's question leads into mine, which was, do you think there is any, what do you think the scope and the possibility of randomized controlled trials of methods is in this area? Because historically, that's why meds, medicines and medical devices are have to be evaluated using randomized controlled trials and not just observational data. Yeah, that's right. So um, there is some appetite for RCTs, uh, and a lot of this really depends on the leadership of the given agencies. Um, when the leadership comes from um, a background in some sort of evidence-based practice, for instance, the uh, the new deputy director of uh, the Allegheny County Department of Human Services, within which uh, Child, Youth, and Family Services lies, um, is an economist by training um, and certainly has a strong appetite for this sort of experimentation. Um, there are many opportunities, and there have been randomized controlled trials um, run in this context to investigate, for instance, the influence of explainability methods. Because um, right now, the tool in Allegheny outputs a score but does not uh, justify its prediction, and there are many interpretability or explainability methods that have been proposed. And this has been studied in the context of uh, Douglas County, Colorado, for instance. Um, so I think there's tremendous potential. Um, it doesn't obviate the need for developing the right tool to answer the right question and performing the right validation in the first place. Um, but if we're interested about impact and those sorts of program evaluation questions, there's certainly a lot that we can do and there's appetite for um, sound, rigorous um, studies of this kind. Yep. Um, Jane, did you have anything uh, to follow on, or, or should I proceed? No, no, thank you. Thank okay. you. Eugenie? Okay, once again, from the educational context, um, have you, you mentioned that you had some synthetic data that you had used for this. Obviously, the data, the raw, the, the actual data is tremendously sensitive, um, but is there, uh, is the synthetic data available for, for use? by people to sort of try to, and did you create, for instance, you know, an R vignette in which you go through the methodology using that, um, using that synthetic data? I, I wish we had, um, and when um, when Amanda has more bandwidth, I think this is the, exactly the sort of thing that I'm going to encourage her to do, um, because when the discussion came up earlier about we need more case studies, I think this is so critically important. Um, every time I write a grant proposal, there's you know a section of broader impacts coming through, like case studies and reports that are broadly accessible, like white papers, because no, let's be honest now, no one actually wants to read my research paper. Um, except for maybe the reviewers, I'm not, I'm not and sure that's, that's only true, because but, they have yeah. to. But I um, think we're trying to, you know, put out this stuff to to people working in industry who have limited time in which to just investigate, and they want to know. Okay, so let me get some case studies in which I can understand the concepts and practice them, and that's have right. some sort of code that I can <laughs> that I can possibly use for for looking at analogous questions. And I think that would be really tremendously valuable. 
That's right. And let me just tell you, um, related to this, something I'm really excited about, which is um, some of the recent work on uh, differentially private synthetic data generation um, that's been okay. coming out. So um, working with synthetic data is... Um, it's not really attractive, right? You don't necessarily know what you're working with. Um, it's difficult to generate it to reflect reality. And if you try some sort of like semi-synthetic approach where, you know, you're modeling your existing data and then creating a synthetic version of it, um, maybe you are actually leaking information, right? So how do we have private, like provably, certifiably private disclosure of this sort of data so that, for instance, more people can participate in auditing processes of these types of models, more people can participate in program evaluation and so that we can facilitate education through case studies that are as realistic um, as possible. Um, so, you know, we don't have methods that work uh, extremely well and that are publicly available and easy to use, right? So it's one of these things like pick two of three. Um, but uh, we're getting there. This is something I'm really excited about in terms of its potential for um, making these tools um, and the learning of these tools much more accessible. Oh, that'd be great. Um, if you have any links to just something to read about about that as well, um, if you could slip them in the chat, that would be great. Sure, let me uh, pull something up. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Um, well, thank you for an absolutely excellent talk, uh, both to you and to Marion. Uh, we're now going to have some closing remarks by Sophia, the other Sophia, <laughs> the smart one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. Is it well with the presentation or not? Do you have a presentation to share? No, no, no. I decided I'm just gonna. I was just gonna listen and just pull out some stuff. I gave some thought to it last night, but some some other thoughts have come to mind. So I'm just, just going to speak. I mean, first of all, just to say what great papers and summary presentations from both. Marion and Alessandra there um, and it's almost it's very difficult to to encapsulate everything that comes up from each of those but let me just try very quickly I think to pull out a few threads which hopefully do not duplicate what you've already heard because it's not my place to take that expert um, insight that both you ladies have and trying to to repackage it but rather what do I hear can I stop you again and just introduce you properly Oh, okay, go on then. <laughs> so thank you very much, Sophia adams Barty. You're the head of strategy and policy at Simmons Wavelength. Uh, you have about 20 years of experience in uh, policy in general, policy and engagement. And I met you when you were director of policy at the Law Society of England and Wales, where you instigated a report on the use of AI in the criminal justice system. And um, I, I'd be very interested to hear your to thoughts, and I'm sorry for interrupting you. Please go ahead. <laughs> absolutely fine. It's absolutely fine. Thank you so much. And so, yeah, I do think that's really relevant. So much of what I'm about to share with you in terms of my response is not embedded in statistics or in maths, or I work in a tech company within a law firm, but I'm neither the lawyer nor the technical expert. I'm the policy person. And I think that matters because I see the world through the lens of policy applied, so applied policy on the ground. So I've worked in a number of institutions um, at the, the front edge of applying policy in a real life situation, whether that be in financial services or in competition and consumer affairs or in healthcare and so on. Um, and so to that effect, oh, I should just apologize. My children are at home because they're both tested positive with COVID, so they might turn up because I can hear them so if you just I just need to put that out there now just in case um because I will no doubt lose my my train of thought when they do rock up so so what do I hear I think there's there's a couple of really emerging themes from this and I let me just turn to Marion's um opening presentation first which is fundamentally what I hear and what I think everybody in the audience regardless of how close or how far you are from in your work to the sorts of things that Marion was describing, was the absolutely central feature of, of all of this work and the red flags that have been raised or the potential good that could be delivered is really understanding impact. 
And interestingly, that weaves itself almost neatly directly to what Alexandra was just describing, which is you take all of the really clever, amazing work in statistics that was done there, which broadly went over my head, I suspect. But essentially, again, what did I see there? I heard this one particular message, which is it has to be contextualized, massively contextualized. And when I talk about in Marion's piece about impact, what I mean there is when Sophia and I first met, and actually Marion and I also worked on this as well, the report we published on the use of AI in the criminal justice system, one of the recommendations in the report that I published there was the importance of undertaking human rights impact assessments at every stage of the development. So you produce a product and you take it to market. Where's your HRA impact assessment? You're about to purchase this product for deployment in the field. Where is your HRA impact assessment? And that was for two reasons. One, to hardwire into the process all the way up the supply chain, the awareness and the importance of considering things like human rights and uh, uh, data protection and so on but to force people to think not about just the bit of the equation they're currently involved in, whether that be development or reduction of crime or assessment of deployment, but to think about impact in its fullest possible sense. And you can only do that, you can only do that well if you understand the context in which it gets deployed. And so, interestingly, the, the Alexandra, you were describing there, trying to get the sort of the text notes of those who um, are taking those calls, that's hugely important because all of that visceral knowledge inside there is another piece of the equation, but so is the knowledge that sits within the teams who go out and work with communities because they know how communities operate. They know that there are certain contexts in which interventions work and certain contexts in which interventions will not work. They won't be quantifiable. And I and I love there's a quote um, by Pascal in his um, work on the black box society, in which he says something to the effect of the, the allure of technology is, is the ability to predict the future, but somewhat tempered by um, sobriety of statistics. <laughs> but there is this massive allure, which is if only we could decipher really complex human behaviours and put it in a neat little box and give it a statistics label and beware of the policy, uh, the weakness in the policy making agenda of wanting to rely and fall back on something that looks like it's done it. It looks like the silver bullet, it looks like it has the answer, it looks objective and it solidly looks like it's got a formula, therefore it must possibly be right. It won't be because actually there's a really complex, multi-dimensional, relationships at play because actually in Alexandra's work and in Marion's work you can boil down social behaviours which is essentially what we're playing with in these contexts down to these relational networks and human relations are incredibly complex and I think therein is a is a is both a, um, a thematic but a really important warning label one that actually I should be saying to our policy makers and the, and the deliverers of our public services, which is they must not become lazy, but equally to those who are in the sitting in the hot seat of developing these tools, which is that is exactly what will happen. <laughs> there is a tendency to want to, because that's easier. I think there's a really strong sense of um, the other big theme that I wanted to pull out, which comes up in Marion's piece and Alexander, you didn't quite get a chance to talk about this one. And I was really, you know, maybe in another another moment in time, we can come back to it. But I want to talk about trust for a moment. And I see in both Marion's work, the importance of um, building systems which are both trustworthy, I demonstrate, that they are trustworthy through transparency, through accountability. So, Marion, I love those that three pillar approach. But as a regulator of 25 or so years, I would say that actually there is a no there are a number of how do I describe them? A number of tenants of well functioning accountability systems, and they rely very squarely on 
um, appetite for intervention, and that is necessarily linked with the risk correlation. And you see some of that coming out in the European regs, don't we, which is high risk applications. They carry slightly um, higher um, thresholds of um, compliance. But essentially what we're saying here is that in order for people to have trust, the accountability system needs to be really robust. And that includes even those systems that don't fall into the high risk category necessarily or aren't identified as being high risk in the in the off chance. And what does that involve? That involves transparency. It involves testing and standards, as you rightly described, but also enforceability. So the enforceability of your rights is a really important part of the accountability um, loop because you can have full transparency, great rules and regulations, but if at the point of failure there is nowhere to seek redress easily and with a parity of arms, i.e. it doesn't require you to be a multimillionaire to get to court and pay really expensive lawyers to fight your battle, that entire regime is hollow doesn't work and because it doesn't work at that it has a cyclical effect because the deterrence falls away and when deterrence doesn't exist away drops compliance well known 101 of regulation so I think a really important tenants of how do we see real life application to these sorts of things and the link from that to Alexandra's piece on trust is as I'm just at the end you got to that point where you said um you might well build these really uh, robust methodologies of assessing risk um, that uh, factor in for all of the concerns, for some, for many of the concerns, maybe not all of the concerns, many of the concerns that people um, like I and others have raised. But the point at which people are willing to trust is another matter altogether. And I think here is something really quite important. And this is why, actually, Eugenia, when you ask your questions about how do we build training into some of the profession, it's really important because it's that training which will allow people to talk across disciplines. And what I mean by this is Michael Gove during the Brexit referendum famously said, the era of the expert is dead and all us experts were aghast, <gasps> shock, horror, what terrible thing to say. And I disagree with Michael Gove on just about everything he says. So it wasn't much of a shock that I didn't agree with him then, apart from in one sense, which is actually there is a gap between the experts and the non-experts. And that gap matters because increasingly in all the data shows that deference in society is heading down and is only heading further and further down. But the, those that know and those that do not know, that gap matters more now than it did 20, 30, 40 years ago. The asymmetries of power matter more now than they did then. And people are seeing, well, they're not seeing, they're feeling the yawning gap. And that's why when people say, but we've, we've developed this really great tool and capability that allows us to take into account the three, four, five, six dimensional issues at play. Will you trust it? They will still probably hesitantly say no, especially so in communities of greater vulnerability and who are at the fringes of, because they already experience the world with huge asymmetries of power and um, autonomy. Um, and voice. And actually the social contract is one which they are seeking to try and push back and they don't want a proxy measure for another expert. They want someone to build something for them to be more powerful and actually what we're seeing is huge amounts of investment in tools which simply make the experts more expert. And that is part of a, um, a growing gap in which you fall um, you fall into the trap of people not trusting these sorts of systems. So I think the sorts of programmes that Eugenie you're talking about are really important because they help people talk across disciplines, which I think is really important. There is so much more I could say, Sophia. I feel like I could go on for a while, but I'm going to stop because it, we're at nine minutes past. I'm pretty sure the invite said we had to wrap up by 15 minutes past. So I'm going to just pause there. There are many other reflections I have. Um, I might just throw them in the chat for later. Um, but there's just a couple of 
themes that stood out writ large across both those presentations that we heard earlier. Apparently I'm muted. <laughs> Thank you very much, very thoughtful as usual. Uh, we'll take a, a few more questions so that we'll finish uh, sort of on time. And I think Eugenie had her hand up. Did. Of course I did. Um, I, I, okay, first, well, first I had a comment, which is I think that you know, one of the things that the NIST proposal does mention specifically is the need to engage with people who will be impacted by the tool. And I think that there's also an issue of whose expertise on what is considered most important. And I think that there need that that's what that's getting at is that these groups that are disempowered often are saying, well, we've got expertise on what our experience is and what has been a problem for us. And it would be nice if somebody actually listened to us for a change before they designed a solution they thought was going to solve our problems. Um, and I had another question. I don't remember what it was, but it might come back to me, but I'll let somebody else step in. Okay. Um, do we do we have um, any other? So, <laughs> any I, other I could just comment that I really appreciate that all your comments, Sophia, because at the moment you might or might not know but there are strikes going on in the university sector about pensions. Yeah. And I have just had the most useless responses from the pensions regulator. Um, so, any advice you have? on how one actually gets regulators. I know the all party parliamentary whistleblowing group is is struggling, but uh, perhaps we might be able to chat later another day. I gave some separate advice on how to navigate the regulators. Um, it's, it's, it's an art form in of itself, but I'm very happy to lend, lend, lend some thought to that. Just Thank to pick you. on Eugenie's point as well a little bit, which is, the user experience is absolutely vital here because I think sometimes we forget in the in the hurry to solve the problems of society, we go expert driven first rather than society and user driven first. What are the out, what are the lived experiences and the outcomes that society needs that is asking for, and then we build towards that. So. There's that really famous example of the policing, over policing in Oakland. Some of you will know that the, the study that was done in 2010, and they looked at all this, um, all the arrests for drug taking and so on in uh, Oakland, I think California. And it looked like this one particular part of Oakland was incredibly, you know, God, they're all criminals, or they're all taking drugs, right? Well, let's throw, send more police there, just like arrest everyone on the street, and that'll be fine. Turned out, all the rich folk from the posh part of town were driving into this particular area, buying their drugs and getting caught. And that's why that particular area's crime rates were so high. The local population of that area was probably quite law abiding, but you wouldn't know that unless you lived there. And if they just walked the streets and talked to the people, they would have said, yeah, most people that buy their drugs actually come from over the border. Um, so I think that's a really good example of, you need to start with the lived experience and work backwards. Thank you. Okay, uh, I've remembered my other question, and we've got two minutes. So it's about um, it's about how to incorporate these um, human rights um, impact evaluations um, into both um, institutional ethics procedures um, and into um, ethics procedures that funders may be using, right? So something that has been done in a lot um, in many other European countries is gender net, where people are being asked to think about the, the differential gendered impact of research or relevance of research, um, but more broadly um, thinking about social impacts, at, um, especially for disciplines like statistics in which we've often sort of, you know, <laughs> not, not been as, as is conscious of that if you've not been working with personal data. So do you have any recommendations for um, for involving those things in those sorts of processes? Yeah, so I mean, th there's probably a, a longer conversation to be had about sort of the guidance that already exists. There's very, the ver at the very broadest level organisations that are now um, embarking upon um, aligning themselves with the UN SDGs, for instance, they're a really great place to start actually, because the ESG framework gives a lot of information. There are, you know, template human rights impact assessments, but how do you build them in? I would say you build them into your BAU of development. So, in a private 
setting, if there is a company, so for instance, you know, I work in a tech company, uh, we come up with a novel idea of something that we might do. And at that sort of two page PID, I don't know if people still use those. So project initiation document, we do a quick thought exercise. And in there already is an impact assessment question, like what's the potential impact? What, you know, how, how do we see this potentially? And at each gateway, you build it into the same routine that you would build in any other checks and balances on the development, on the purpose, on progress, project management tools, business oversight, ensuring that those key decision points are stop, go and oversight, whether that comes from a board or from an ethics committee or from the executive oversight arrangements, that they have responsibility to ask for some insights as to what's happening in terms of even consideration of impact. And it needn't be um, theses, because actually more often than not, something slightly more streamlined will get you 80% of the way there. Um, as a good colleague of mine says, the sniff test is really easy. <laughs> Just start with that. <laughs> Smells a bit funny. Try, try again. Um, so I would say that's really important, but actually, this is a this is a grassroots movement, but it's also a top down, which is I think organisations struggle to deliver on initiatives like this uh, um, unless the top of the top of the shop is equally committed. So, um, in many respects, I would say, and I have said this previously, you can boil this down to nothing other than pure good business ethics um, or practice of of corporate behaviour and ethics, um, and that should start at the top. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? I do not see any hands up and we're one minute over time. So thank you very much, Sophia, for keeping it all <laughs> to time. Um, so thank you all for coming. It's been an extremely interesting session. Uh, we recorded the talks, um, so we'll, we'll put them up and maybe uh, a few links, like for instance, the NIST report that was mentioned. Um, and. Um, there will be more activities that Maria and I will organize. So thank you also for, to Maria, who's not clapping her hands. <laughs> and thank you to the speakers and Sophia for her very rapid but uh, very informative summary of, all the, of, of both talks. All for two is perhaps excessive. So thank you very, very much. And I wish you all a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>